Um, Asif, have you mic'd me in? Good morning, everybody. Delighted to be here. Thanks, Amol, for inviting me. Um, so I um, I'm re recovering from a very bad bout of viral. I lost my voice this weekend, and I think I've kind of gotten it back in time to talk to you a little bit about taking you beyond Earth's orbit. So for those of you in the room who flew in like I did into Mumbai, do you know how high you fly when you are in a commercial jetliner? That's right. It's about 10 to 11 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. As we sit here, there's an international space station orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes. Do you know how high that flies? That flies at about 400 kilometers from the Earth. And technically, about 100 kilometers from the surface, we define it as outer space. So even when you're in outer space, you're still, in some ways, within the atmospheric blanket. That's where it starts. So when tourism companies like Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, offer you suborbital flights, they're essentially saying, we can take you to about 100 kilometers, let you float free for a few seconds, look at the curvature of the Earth, and bring you back, all for about $400,000. So that's where private space flight is today, if you ask me. I'd like to start with this, one of my favorite photographs taken by, oh, I was hoping this would be right in the center, but OK. Uh, this is a beautiful photograph taken by a German journalist from Hamburg who is an Indophile, and he traveled all the way from Hamburg to Shrikota to watch a PSLV launch. Because there's nothing quite like seeing a real launch, right? the boom that you can see in your heart. He came all the way. He could not get permission to go inside the viewing area at the spaceport. So he chose to stay out and see the PSLV go up with the people of Nellore, the village, which is adjoining Shri Kota. And what a beautiful photograph that is. You see young girls, uh, an infant, and women watching the rocket soar. I think what's beautiful about the Indian space program is that it has always enjoyed the unwavering support of the public and the politicians. No matter who's in Delhi, they always have supported our space program. This is yet another beautiful black and white from the 60s. You can see the nose cone of a sounding rocket being carried on the back of a bicycle in Tumba in 1966. The photograph was taken by the French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson. Um, this is also a reminder for everybody in the room that India's space program is one of the oldest in the world. We did our first experimental launch in November of 1963. I know there are some millennials, too, in the audience. So do you know when Sputnik went up? No? 69 is when the Apollo landing happened. OK, I think it's 1959 or 57. When did Yuri Gagarin fly into space? 1961. So in 63, India conducted the first experimental sounding rocket launch. That gives you the vintage of our program. The one next to it, you see a grainy video of a TV grab from the first Apollo landing in 96, sorry, 69. My dad used to be in Canada then, and I was raised among the pioneers who started India's space program in the 60s. So my dad was one of the first recruits when he came back from Germany and Sarabhai had just started hiring in 67, 68. So I grew up amongst the people who actually started the program. And the pioneers, if you ask me, are very different from those who are running it today. And that's true of any country. You know, even when you meet the Apollo guys who, who ran the American space program in the 60s, they are amazing. They're all in the 80s and 90s. But, but it's, the pioneers are a different lot. I also grew up amongst amazing architects in Ahmedabad, because the Kotalman Ola families, the Sarabhais, the Lalbhais, the Hathi Singhs, they would invite amazing architects, both from India and abroad, to design private residences and public buildings. So if you juxtapose architecture and space together, what you have is space architecture. 
It's an invented discipline. There was no such thing as space architecture when I, as a high school kid, decided this is what I want to do. I want to design things for living in outer space, right? So what I'm going to do is, since it's a CFO summit, I'm going to talk about the geopolitics of space and the global space economy with a backdrop of my own professional trajectory. So my professional trajectory began in 1997 when I was placed at NASA Johnson in Houston. So those were the days when I had access to all buildings uh, at NASA. You know, after 9-11, everything changed. So in the middle of the night, we used to go to mission control to look at the second Hubble repair mission live. Uh, how many of you even remember the Hubble telescope? There is now a new telescope called the James Webb Telescope. And if you haven't seen the kind of images that telescope is beaming back to us, you absolutely should. It's they're mesmerizing. I think we humans always think the Homo sapiens are a very advanced species, right? But look at what a virus did to me last week. I mean, it takes you down. It reminds you that we Homo sapiens are still quite a primitive species, if you ask me. This is a photograph where you're looking out of one of the big windows on the Mir space station onto space shuttle Atlantis. This is the time I was at NASA Johnson in 97 when the United States and Russia started cooperating and every six months or so an American astronaut would go and live on the Mir space station, the orbiting Mir space station which was up in orbit for almost 15 years. The American astronaut would spend anywhere from four to six months what we in spaceflight call long duration, on the station. So the space shuttle, so those of you who are familiar with the space shuttle, this shuttle fleet had four shuttles. So one of the four shuttles, Atlantis, was adapted to dock with me. So when you're, when you're orbiting the Earth and you want to go and say hello to another spacecraft, one is you have to often maneuver your altitude, right? But you also have to have the right docking mechanism to go and say hello. So one of the four space shuttles, Atlantis, they had to put a special airlock which could adapt to the docking port of the Mir space station, and that's what you're looking at. The other thing I want you to, if I have a pointer, no, I don't have a, maybe I do, is look at the left end. You see a beautiful, large mechanical cover. The Russian space station, most windows have beautiful mechanical covers, because of which, even after 15 years, the window is as pristine as you can see in this photograph. The Russian approach to human space flight and the American approach are quite different. I mean, this is not the place for me to talk about how they approach human space flight, but I think that's something to keep in mind. The Russians live up there as if it's a natural extension of their, you know, earthly existence. They are, if you ask me, the true masters of human spaceflight. There have been Russian cosmonauts who spent a year or more in space, and that's very difficult because in microgravity, what happens is your bones and your muscles atrophy. So every waking hour, when you're not experimenting, when you're not doing housekeeping, all of your waking hours, when you're not actually, you're, you're really busy on the station or on, on the shuttle, you're spending it exercising because you don't want to come back a vegetable. You have to. <clears throat> so after Johnson, I worked at Boeing in Southern California, in Huntington Beach, where it's a site where they make Delta rockets. It's nearly impossible for a foreign national, it could even be a Canadian national, doesn't matter, to work on sites where they make rockets. Because space, by its very nature, is dual purpose. Rockets are nothing but missiles, missiles are rockets. So Boeing really went out of its way to hire an Indian national to work on a site where it's very difficult for any foreign national to work. In. And what I did while I was with Boeing is I was not designing things for living in outer space, but international business development. Most of the people who worked for the space station program were busy spending the money to build this massive space station. Mine was a small group of 12 people 
that was actually bringing in money for the program. We used to do bid and proposal, negotiate contracts, manage international contracts, and we would sell anything from a small space qualified, mind you, fire extinguishers to anything as large as a complete module. There are 16 partners on the International Space Station program, which makes it one of the most difficult international undertakings ever. What you're seeing here is the space station after it was completely built. The yellow long panels, those are the solar panels, which can be unfurled. The white crinkly things, they are thermal radiators. And the overall size of the space station is roughly equivalent on, in earthly terms to about two football fields. And of the 16 partners, the two leading partners are the United States and Russia. Right? So even today, the geopolitical turmoil that the world finds itself in, Russia and the United States have decided to continue to work together for the space station program. Because otherwise, the space station program will come to an end. I am a big believer in technology diplomacy. I'm probably the only Indian who has worked with the Americans, the Europeans, the Russians, the Japanese, and the Indians on, the space, you know, on various space programs. And I think one of the best, best ways to ensure the world doesn't go off course with the many wars that we've had, even in my lifetime, is through international cooperation. So I think the space station is a great example of that. In 2000, when I was 29, I decided it's time to move on. And I moved to San Francisco, and I started my first small company. Back then, the word startup didn't exist. Now, if you ask me, it's been beaten to death. Everything is a startup. Well, a startup is nothing but a small company, which someone goes out and decides that he or she wants to change the world in a small way that he or she can. And I think the, the idea of leaving Boeing uh, was based on two things that I wanted. One is when you work for a large company or a large space agency, you cannot speak your mind. You have to toe the line. And I'm the kind who likes to challenge the status quo. So when my super boss warned me, uh, you know, he said to Smita, he brought me in and said, think about leading, leaving a stable job. And you know, nobody's going out starting space companies. So I told him, yes, I know that. But I think this is the best way to change the world. So this was a small company. We had six partners. We engaged in a variety of very eclectic projects, including putting NASA on Second Life, if you remember what Second Life is. And this, just as an impression, is one of the many concepts of a future moon base that was generated at a workshop that I conducted with two of my friends in Europe, in the Netherlands where we had 60 young European architects, industrial designers, engineers come together and imagine the future. So I'm not going to go into the design of this, but let's talk about the moon a little bit. On Earth, we take everything for granted. Gravity, atmospheric pressure, natural illumination, and the gamut of colors of the electromagnetic spectrum that we see, right? On moon, everything is sort of black and white and gray. There is no atmosphere. There is no running water. So when you, when you pick up lunar dust or lunar regolith, it's very, very fine and very sharp like glass. It gets into everything. It gets into the mechanical parts of your lunar buggy. It gets into the creases of your spacesuit. And if you were to breathe it and bring it into your space habitat, it'll sit in your lungs. It smells like burnt gunpowder. It's very sharp because there are no weathering forces. Like pick up a grain of sand and you'll see running water and wind, how it's you know, rounded it off. So living on the moon is going to be treacherous for two reasons. One is lunar dust, and the second is radiation. On Earth, <clears throat> in addition to the atmosphere, we have two Van Allen radiation belts that protect us, especially during solar storms and increased solar activity. On the moon, that cover is gone. So we space architects have to think about how to protect the astronauts who would be living on the moon for even short periods of time. Uh, there are two ways, essentially, as of today. One is 
you build bunkers, like you build walls using lunar regolith, or you choose to build into lava tubes where you're protected. The other way is to create walls of water. But when I started in the late 90s and now, a lot has changed, right? We are 3D printing now. So let's go on to my next company. So in 2000, I started Moonfront in San Francisco. In 2005, I started a second company in Vienna. How many of you have heard of Vienna? If I say Austria, people think I'm talking about Australia. No, Austria. You know Mozart and Beethoven. So Vienna is where I co-founded my second company in 2005. And this company is now 17 years old. And the idea, remember I said the reason I left a big company like Boeing was to do things differently. So the NASAs of the world only hire engineers. I mean, this is a mentality of the 1960s, right? A SpaceX or a Blue Origin would also hire industrial designers and architects and interface designers and what have you. So in 2004, 2005, me and my friend who co-founded it, we wanted to send a message to NASA, to the European Space Agency and others, that it's time that you moved away from an engineering-centric approach to design and use an interdisciplinary approach to design where you bring in industrial designers, architects, ergonomists, color theorists, psychologists, sociologists. Because if humans have to live in space for long periods of time, you can't expect them to live in little machines that the engineers put together. So let the engineers make it safe and survivable, but let the designers and architects also take care of human factors. Right? If you're depressed while you're on a long duration space flight, the mission is doomed. Right? So you're looking at a space habitat, which we designed for a crew of two, and you're looking at a rover in the background, which we designed as a rover that can be used on the moon and Mars. And this company not only does pretty pictures, we actually do the systems engineering, the systems architecture, outfit these things, and build full-scale prototypes. And we also test these prototypes in what we call analog environments. For example, the habitat here was tested in Rio Tinto in Spain, which has a terrain very similar to Mars. So we actually transport our habitats, our rovers, to these environments and test them. If you want to test something for the moon, what do we do? We take them underwater in a reduced gravity environment. We do underwater simulations as well. I moved back to India in 2008. Just to give you a sense, I was born around the time the last Apollo landing happened. You'll have to look up when that happened. And I, or you could say when ISRO got incorporated formally as a space agency. That's ISRO's trajectory and my trajectory have been running in parallel for a long time. So this is Earth to Orbit, my third venture. I know everybody says I started India's first space startup, but really, it's no big deal. You know, it was, what is important is, when I moved back to India, I looked at where India was in 2008, and having grown up with the space program, I identified one of the rockets, the PSLV, which was first launched in 1993, and by 2008, it was a very reliable, very mature rocket in its class. So one of the first things I did, I had my intern look up all the foreign payloads the PSLV had launched from 1999 to 2008. And guess what? The total payload mass added up to around 1,500 kilograms. And that is not equal to even one whole single PSLV launch because it can take a payload load of, I think, around 1,600, the standard variant. So we decided one of the first missions of the company will be to see who are the current customers and how do we bring the Japanese, so we, we found the Europeans come to ISRO very easily because we have great bilateral relations, right? So what was missing is we didn't have the Japanese flying with us and the Americans flying with us. So our first launch client was a Japanese university. We flew their payload, a little blue satellite, in 2012 on the same launch where we flew a French satellite, the Spot 6. The more difficult was how do we get an American satellite to fly on the PSLV because in 1998, when India conducted nuclear tests, the year I started working for Boeing is when US imposed an embargo on India. I guess some of you remember the 1990 embargo. 
So under the embargo, the Americans, the companies were not even allowed to sell space components to India, let alone launch an American satellite on a foreign rocket. That was out of question. So for this particular mission, what I decided to do is what I would call soft diplomacy. So Earth to Orbit was a startup, and our first launch client was a Stanford startup called Skybox Imaging. And Skybox was the first space startup in the United States to have raised private capital in the Valley. So I think two startups getting together, they hired an ITAR lawyer. ITAR are these stringent export control regulations that they've had from the 60s. And I, over three years, went and met almost 14 diplomats and bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., and Delhi, and had conversations to show them why we need to make it happen. I'll have to write a book about it someday, but after four years, we did manage to sign the first launch agreement between ISRO, as in their commercial arm, and Skybox Imaging, and that was historic. So despite an embargo, we, I could say, brought down a mini Berlin Wall, and it isn't easy, but diplomacy works. And especially when independent agents like myself play an ambassadorial role for their country and for the country they've lived in, there's a new level of trust and understanding, which is difficult if you're official diplomats because you have to toe the line and say what your government wants you to say. So the ice was broken. And, and if you remember, in February 2018, we had the headlines, 104 satellites flew aboard the PSLV, and that was a world record. Out of the 104 satellites, 96 were American. So had I not spent those five years going between DC and Delhi to convince diplomats on both sides that we need to make this happen, that wouldn't have happened. So in my mind, India should have started liberalizing its space economy in the early part of the millennium. We started too late, but at least we've started. In 2020, June, the government announced space reforms. They want to liberalize the Indian space economy. But I think what is missing is a robust policy framework and space legislation, which is why two years ago I decided India needs to have its own space think tank, which is what I launched right after the pandemic in October of 2021. We want our policy to be evidence-driven and not be ad hoc. We also want space legislation. We want India to have a voice in the international fora. Even that, if you ask me, needs to be amplified. I think I'll sort of round it all up with this particular slide, which is, it gives you an idea of the global space economy, not the defense side of the space programs, but just the civilian side. The defense is another big chunk. It is, let's round it off to 400 billion US dollars a year. And if you look at it, we have the biggest chunk is satellite services. You know, your direct-to-home television, your GPS, your integrated services. It's, it's a part of our everyday lives. So the 118 billion, that's the satellite services chunk. Ground equipment is another big chunk. It's about $142 billion. Satellite manufacturing is a relatively smaller chunk, around $14 billion. And launch is an even smaller chunk of about $6 billion, you could say, if you rounded it off. The non-satellite industry, where you have the government space budgets and the commercial human flight uh, spendings, it's about 100 billion. Let's put things in perspective. 400 billion dollars annual revenues for the international civilian space marketplace, right? What, what role does India play in this? You know, the whole idea when I came back to India and I wanted the PSLV to be one of the most sought after rockets in the international arena was exactly this. We need to capture a significant portion of that pie, and we are not even featuring in it in any significant way today. Right? So one of my first requests to the Ministry of Commerce and Industry is let us baseline the size of India's space economy. The only report I've seen so far by one of the big consulting firms, I wouldn't even call it a report. We need to see how other countries take a great deal of pain and with a lot of rigor, come up with a sizing and the health of their space industry, and we need to do the same. That should be step one. If we have to go from a fledgling space economy to a developed space economy. The other thing we should keep in mind is, if you heard the budget, the finance minister announced 
about 12,500 crores for ISRO this year, which is about 8% less than last year, 13,700 crores last year. So if, let us say, ISRO wants a little less money this year for its missions, that 8%, that which is about 1,100 crores, or it translates into roughly, what, $130 million, it should be given to new space companies. Even if you give 130 million to 13 companies, it's just 10 million a piece. That's nothing. So I think while we have the intention for space reforms, we need to match it with the right kind of funding allocations to the private sector. Okay, and of course, don't forget there are legacy companies too. The LNTs, the Valchans, the Tatas, you know, or Godrej, who've act been contributing system and subsystem level things to ISRO for 50 years. So what I'm trying to say is, intention is good, but again, this, I wanted to show you the 100-year clock. We always think in 24-hour cycles, we need to break away and think, where do we want to be 100 years from now, 50 years from now? So if you look at the major markers, the first 50 years, my dad's generation made us technology independent, but that's not where we need to stop. I think the next 25 and 50 years, we need to grow the space economy. We need to generate employment. You know, a single OEM in the US hires about 100,000 people. A small space agency cannot do that. We need to have at least three large companies doing that in India. Only then can we call ourselves a developed space economy. So I think that here, here is sort of a vision for where we need to head. And this is my last slide. I wanted to bring in Mariana Matsukato. She's an Italian-American economist who has written this wonderful book called The Entrepreneurial State. It's a great reminder that no matter what you say, you have to back it up with funds. And she has done deep research into the history of the Silicon Valley. She advises the European Union. Uh, she has shown that all the big companies, whether it's Google, whether it's Apple, whether it's SpaceX, have all benefited immensely from government grants. Even Elon Musk and his three companies, Tesla, SpaceX, and SolarCity, in the early years, got almost $5 billion in US grants. And today, a company like SpaceX lives off of NASA and DOD funds. So the government has to be the anchor customer if we are to have these kind of big companies in India. And I think I'll end the talk with, I hope, that our finance minister, our minister of space, understand that if we invest heavily in our new space companies, you know, like I said, the 130 million could have been given to 13 companies. The return on investment will be 50-fold because the kind of appetite these kids have for risk, the kind of talents they have, the only thing stopping them really is funds, the kind of funds that is available to young entrepreneurs in the United States, in Europe. So we need to be bolder. We need a complete overhaul of our mindset. We still are carrying this 20th century mindset. And I think what's most important is let's be generous. Give them the funds. They'll build things for you. And they're doing cutting edge work. I'm not going to talk about it because I think the whole idea was to give you a sense of where we are and where we need to go. Thank you.